Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Steve Orlands, President of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations, and I'm thrilled today to be joined by my good friend, Taylor Fravel. Taylor is the Arthur and Ruth Sloan Professor of Political Science and a member of the Security Studies Program at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. I think you're now head of the Security Studies Program. I'm now director, yes. yes. So since this book was yes. published, he has become head of the Security Studies Program at MIT. He is also an, the author of this very recent book, China's Military Strategy Since 1949. Active Defense, which I've just completed. Taylor, what made you write this book and why now? Um, so I actually started the project 10 years ago. Uh, so it wasn't linked to uh, sort of current uh, challenges in U.S.-China relations. But the reason why I, I decided to write the book was that certainly within the academic literature and even in the policy literature, we didn't have a book that systematically looked at how China has uh, thought about military strategy and the strategies it's uh, adopted since 1949. So, you know, Certainly, China's military power is an extremely important question today. But if we want to understand how states uh, think about using their military power, we want to look to military strategies. So I thought uh, it would be sort of a terrific uh, topic to work on uh, because of, of it, it, its importance to uh, think about no, China's future. There was no previous literature on this? There are books that look at China's military strategies at different points in time, uh, but there's never been a systematic study that sort of traces the development of China's military strategy since 1949. And what did it tell you about China's strategic ambition today? Um, so uh, sort of the big arc in the book is that China's sort of strategy has moved from defending China uh, fr from an invasion for sort of the first 40 years, from 49 to the late 1980s. and. Uh, more recently in the last 30 years in terms of projecting power, uh, especially in sovereignty disputes and its frontier. And so uh, one could project forward to say that if China completes these two missions, right, if it's a, able to defend itself from uh, invasion, which it certainly would be able to do today, and uh, secondarily, if it can sort of achieve its goals in its territorial disputes, then it could think about projecting uh, power further from its borders in the future. But I think for the time being, certainly with Taiwan and the disputes in the East China Sea and the South China Sea, China will remain focused in East Asia. Up and in the being. initial phase, it was predominantly a focus on the Soviet Union. Actually, so for the first 20 years, um, the PRC military strategy was focused on defeating a U.S. invasion, which they believed mm -hmm. would occur on the Shandong Peninsula. And mm -hmm. we tend to forget uh, the hostility that existed between the U.S. and China in the 50s right. and the 60s. And uh, when the Chinese looked at their sort of security environment at that time, the U.S. was the most dangerous threat. And when they thought about how the U.S. had fought in the Korean War, they worried greatly that the U.S. would try to uh, conduct an amphibious assault uh, as a way, as the main way of attacking China. After sort of the mid-1960s, the threat uh, shifts northward and, and focuses mm -hmm. on the Soviet Union, which remains sort of the focus until the mid uh, to late 1980s. Mm -hmm. Did that shift um, occur kind of after the Nixon visit? Was that kind of the pivotal moment when they switched from worrying about a U.S. invasion to worrying about Soviet invasion and a lot of the tension that was occurring on the uh, Sino-Soviet border? No, it actually uh, begins before Nixon's visit. Yes. So in, in, in 1960, late 65, early 1966, I think is when you see uh, a real change in the military relationship between China and the Soviet Union. Uh, at that time, the Soviet Union begins to uh, deploy increasing numbers of divisions right. along uh, the border with China, signs a security treaty with Mongolia, which then allows them to, to deploy more troops on uh, the Mongolian border with China, leading up to the clash at Damansky or Jambao Island in um, March of 1969. So that was the real turning point. After March of 1969, China concluded that right. it faced a real invasion threat, especially in light of the Brezhnev Doctrine that had been employed the previous year in Czechoslovakia by the Soviet Union. They thought China, when they went to China Czechoslovakia, they realized there was a chance that they would go yes. into China in the same way. Yes. You talk in the book extensively about kind of the need for party unity mm -hmm. when you're going to have a change in the in the the, the military strategy. Mm -hmm. um, Talk about where that is today, and talk about was there a change in military strategy relating to the South China Sea, and was there party unity behind that? So party unity refers to sort of, or at least as I conceptualize it in the book, agreement among kind of China's uh, top uh, political leaders, the top party leaders, about the sort of distribution of power and authority within the party and agreement on kind of basic policies uh, to pursue. So from 
on that definition, I would say there's certainly party unity in China today. It might be fragile because of the way in which Xi Jinping has sort of gotten agreement with mm -hmm. respect to either his policies or his authority. But the, the, there, there does not appear to be a split in the leadership like we saw in the Cultural Revolution or even like we saw in 1989 after uh, Tiananmen, right? So in that sense, I think it's unified. And then the reason why this matters in the context of the book is that when the party leadership is unified in this way, it delegates a lot of responsibility for military affairs to senior military officers, mm -hmm. uh, which is a dynamic you might not expect in a, a, without such a politicized armed force, right? You wouldn't necessarily expect the military to have such leeway with respect to questions of strategy. In terms of the South China Sea, at, at least in terms of the strategic guidelines that are sort of the focus of the book, I think they play a secondary but important role in the most recent strategy that was adopted in July of 2014, which the Chinese call winning and formatized local wars. So part of that strategy uh, remained very much focused on Taiwan, but part of it also emphasized the challenges that China faced in the so-called uh, maritime direction, which would include both the disputes in the East China Sea and the South China Sea. Was there consensus around what they should be doing in the South China Sea? My experience is there has been there was significant pushback uh, from not the PLA, mm -hmm. but in other parts of the, of the bureaucracy against this. I think there was consensus at the top, right? Whether there's consensus in lower levels of the party, uh, I'm not sure, right, for the reasons that you mentioned. But at least as I sort of conceptualize or think about party unity at the top, it's not necessary. It doesn't refer to agreement over all the policies uh, that they might pursue in the, in the security realm, but that they're basically the party leadership is stable and that has this sort of function of empowering the military to pursue what it wants to pursue, especially with regards to uh, uh, military strategy. Now, the South China Sea is an interesting case, but I think if we look at how it evolved under Hu Jintao uh, from, say, 2010 through uh, to the present, you see actually more continuity in China's approach to the South China Sea. And that 2012, although I think the rate of Chinese activity increases, it actually is following a, a trajectory and, and a set of sort of priorities that was laid out by Hu Jintao. Some of the Chinese who work on this issue say that this whole um, range of activities that they've engaged in were a reaction to a requirement under the convention, the, the Law of the Sea Convention, that you file your claims. Okay. And up to then, it could have been ambiguous, but that at that point, they had to kind of take these stands. Did you see anything supporting that? No. I mean, that's an interesting reading of the convention. I think well, you, had, you had to file you. There is no you, question you had to then actively file your claims, that you could not rely on traditional... Um, assertions of claims you had to actually file them well yeah you, you have to you, you have to file them uh, which would account for i think what we saw sort of in 2009 and you have to yes. reaffirm them whenever somebody else challenges them but i don't think that means you have to build artificial islands for example right, right? Uh, because china already had a, a physical presence that it could use to affirm right. its claim and so i, I would not put a lot of a weight in that particular mm -hmm. argument you're one of the four authors of the letter to the president and the speaker and mm -hmm. the majority leader, which was published in the Washington Post, Post, addressing the dangers of considering China an enemy. Now, full disclosure, I signed that letter mm -hmm. too. How did the research and conclusions of this book influence your views on this matter? Well, to take a step back, I think the open letter, at least from my perspective, was about addressing uh, what I viewed and some of the other people who helped write the letter, which includes more than the five people who signed it in the Washington Post, that a lot of the policies that were being adopted were going to be misguided. And uh, so from a military perspective, uh, the debate would focus on if the U.S. is still trying to maintain sort of a strategy or a posture of primacy uh, in the region, would that um, lead to more or less conflict with China? And also, would that allow the U.S. to best defend its interests? So I think the research in this book would show uh, that China obviously is very committed to defending what it views as its core interests, which would include the sovereignty of of the homeland as well as these areas where sovereignty is disputed and that, that that's a challenge that the U.S. is really going to have to grapple with and that there would be different ways in which the U.S. could uh, aid those countries uh, that are facing China in this manner. So the strategy that, military strategy that I prefer uh, versus primacy is what, what is called active denial whereby you posture your forces in the region in such a way that you uh, deny China the ability to rapidly achieve its objectives, which then has a deterrent function and allows space for diplomacy and, and other uh, sort of policies to be pursued. And so I think you know, having studied 
you know, 70 years of uh, PRC military strategy, it helped me think a, a little bit about what kind of the best military response uh, the U.S. could adopt in the face of, of the military challenge that China does pose. Mm -hmm. Do you think China regards, I mean, clearly there's no disagreement that Taiwan, Xinjiang, Tibet are core interests mm -hmm. of China and the sovereignty is indisputable. Um, do you think they view the South China Sea the same way? I don't think they view it the same way. Um, but involve, but it nevertheless involves sovereignty, and when sovereignty is involved, right, it, it's usually a high stakes issue for states. Now there can be, but it's not a core interest. In other words, the core interest. When I started studying China, mm -hmm. which was a long, long time ago, you know, the definition of core yes. interest really was Xinjiang, Tibet, and Taiwan, and that it was something that they could not compromise on. They could not negotiate. It really, it was a term of art right. in Chinese foreign policy. Recently, there are many who say that the, the Chinese consider um, the South China Sea a core interest. Now, I've never heard them say that, but there are many in the United right. States who assert that. No, so, I mean, I, I would agree with your uh, definition of core interest. I would say Taiwan, Hong Kong, and, you know, Xinjiang are, and Tibet are the core of the core, right? right? right. But, but... But they never used to mention Hong Kong, that. But now that's yes, become a that's know, become a problem. It has right? become a problem. Um, so, but sovereignty disputes can still escalate to the use of force, right? Uh, and 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 so it puts them in this sort of in between category where they're not core interests as, as traditionally uh, defined or conceptualized, but they are nevertheless issues over which all states, not just China, will, will uh, prepare to use armed force to defend their claims, hmm. right? And so China still has six unresolved territorial disputes today. You know Taiwan. Um, the South China Sea, the East China Sea, uh, the border with India, uh, and the border uh, with uh, Bhutan, right? And mm -hmm. then the South China Sea, you have separate disputes over the Paracels yeah. and, and the Spratly. So these are still real concerns uh, that motivate Chinese military strategy, even though they don't, apart from Taiwan, rise to the level of what Beijing has traditionally defined as its core interests. Right. How many, if you were writing this book 30 years ago, how many disputes with China? How many border disputes would China have had? So China, um, China's had 23 territorial disputes since 1949. So I wrote my first book, actually looked at China's territorial right. disputes. Now, 30 years ago, uh, they would have, uh, I'm going to have to go back and, 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 and check roughly, the list, but roughly. I would say roughly, uh, they probably had 10 or 12 outstanding territorial disputes. So And they resolved almost all of them. They, they resolved uh, 12 out of 14 land border disputes right. and one of their offshore island disputes. They also resolved, um, of course, people will debate how they resolved them, the disputes over Hong Kong and Macau, right? So um, that leaves you know, six uh, disputes and, today. And are those, were those resolved because they're just easier to resolve? And they've left the harder ones, mm -hmm. or were they resolved because China was at that point in time willing to compromise, and is less willing today to compromise because it's a stronger power? Both China was willing to compromise, and they were easier to solve. Yeah. And but I think China was more willing to compromise because they were less important and less easier to solve. Uh, so if you look at say the the border with uh, Kazakhstan, which was settled in a series of agreements in the 1990s, yeah. uh, some of that territory was probably quite important to Kazakhstan. Most, most of it was probably not that important to China. And so it was right. pretty easy to come up with a, not easy, but relatively easy to come up with a compromise solution uh, to divide that territory. But it wasn't as if the China-Kazakh border had immense strategic importance. It didn't uh, contain a large uh, population who might view themselves as either Chinese or Kazaki. It didn't contain um, um, you know, significant deposits of, of minerals or other resources. And so in that sense, the, the, the overall sort of salience of a lot of the land borders has been lower than, than those disputes that remain today. So I often tell people that um, you know, China was able to settle you know, uh, the majority of its territorial disputes, but those that remain, remain in part because they're more resistant to settlement, because the stakes are seen as a lot higher from China's well, perspective. Some of the, some of the, uh, the disputes over water, have, with Vietnam, for instance, have mm -hmm. been resolved. That was resolved. That was resolved at a time that people didn't think islands were very important. So it was resolved mm -hmm. in the late 1950s mm -hmm. uh, uh, over what's known as White Dragon Tail Island yeah. by Long Way Dao. Now, at the time when Mao decided it could be transferred to North Vietnam, it was seen as an act of generosity to a yeah. fraternal socialist uh, a party that was engaged in its own revolution and really not that important to China. I think it would have been a lot harder uh, if that dispute was still active today for Xi Jinping or even Hu Jintao probably to transfer 
to agree to transfer that island uh, to, to, to Vietnam because of the way in which uh, islands have become more important for asserting uh, maritime claims or claims to maritime mm -hmm. jurisdiction. When will China actually have the power to really enforce its will in the South China Sea? Because it's not only a question of strategy, it's a question of what your capability is. Um, the, I think they're working hard towards developing that capability if you look at the way in which the surface fleet has been modernizing. And you know, just on sheer tonnage, right, uh, what China has been able to accomplish in the last two decades in terms of shipbuilding is quite remarkable. But whether or not they're able to do so also depends on what actions other countries the tonnage take. Tonnage is not a great metric. Tonnage is not a great metric. <laughs> but but Even I, who know nothing about the military, know that tonnage is not a great metric. Tonnage is not a great metric, but most people assess the ships that China is building to, today to be quite good ships. Mm -hmm. uh, there are questions about how well they can operate them. There are questions about the weapon system that are aboard the ships. But nevertheless, in terms of sort of their basic design and you know stealth profiles and, and everything else, you know, they're, they're, they're pretty good ships. But China's not developing this power in a vacuum. Other countries have a say. Other countries will uh, want to develop capabilities to be able to, to resist China to varying degrees. It's not a surprise, for example, that Vietnam also buys uh, submarines from the Russians um, because uh, it views that as, as a good asymmetric means to sort of counterbalance China and the South China Sea. Then there, of course, the, the, there is the, the, the role that the U.S. Navy will play. Mm -hmm. We're out of time, but this just gives you a sense of Taylor Fravel's new book, China's military strategy since 1949, active defense. If you want to know about kind of what China and the PLA are doing and thinking about, absolutely need to read it. Taylor, thank you much for joining us. He is also, I should say, a director of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations. So if you think I've gone easy in this interview, you know why. No, seriously, it's been a <laughs> try to ask the tough questions. But thanks for joining us. Thank you.